We are focusing on digital commerce tonight. And we've got five great companies that are going to be presenting. My name is Lori Hoberman. I am a board member with the MIT Enterprise Forum. And I also am an attorney here at Chad Warren Park, where I head up the emerging company venture capital practice. Uh, I wanted to tell you, just from an MIT Enterprise Forum standpoint, that we have some exciting events coming up. Uh, and there are, I think, a flyer outside on it. On Wednesday, February 15th, there's an event entitled A New Age in Patent Liquidity. And on April 18th, we have an exciting event in cloud computing. And you can get all this information from the website, the MIT Enterprise Forum New York Chapter website. So um, the rules of the road for this business plan competition. We have five companies. Each company will have five minutes to present. And we're, we're pretty strict about the time for the companies who are presenting. There's going to be a gentleman right here. Wave your hand, Natal, who's going to hold up a, a sign. You have a sign? Uh, my hand? All right. He's going to hold up his hand with one when it's a one minute mark. So you have a sense of where you are in the presentation. And then we're going to do five or six minutes or so of panel feedback and suggestions, and we will invite audience comment also. So to start, I thought it would be nice for our panelists to just do a very brief 30 to 60 second introduction <laughs> of themselves. You don't have to be exact. Just introduce yourselves and, uh, and talk a little bit about the funds that you're here from. Do you want to, Sam, why don't you start? What's funny? Are you going to make the lawyer attorney comment? No, no, no. I never make it. All right, don't. And, and, and keep the microphone off if you're going to do lawyer jokes. <laughs> push that in. Oh, there we go. Good. Cool. All right, hi. Uh, Sim Blaustein, uh, BDMI, uh, which is part of Bertelsmann, for those of you do, who don't know. I'm actually on my third week, so I'm still getting the spiel for the fun down. Um, but uh, Bertelsmann, uh, global media company, one of the largest based in Germany. Um, we're the corporate venture fund. Um, our orientation is financial, so we actually look pretty much like a normal venture capital fund um, with the special sauce slash added uh, weight of uh, looking for uh, opportunities that match within the uh, businesses uh, of Bertelsmann. Um, prior to BDMI, I was at a fund called Highline Venture Partners, which is a seed fund I helped co-found in early 2010. Um, spent some time in M&A at IC before that, and I was actually at uh, MIT Sloan before that. It'll stop there. So I'm David Tedden. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, I've been a serial entrepreneur for the last 12 years. As of June of last year, I just joined FF Venture Capital as a partner. Uh, FF is one of the most active early stage investors in New York. We've made over 55. Uh, we have over 55 companies in the portfolio and have made over 100 <coughs> investments in the portfolio. Some of the better known ones are Clout, uh, uh, Quigo, which was bought by AOL for 340 million plus, Cornerstone On Demand, which went public last year. Uh, our strategy is to be the institutional player in the early stage space. Most of the other investors in our space are angels or micro VCs. Uh, we have eight full-time employees. We have 5,000 square feet of office space. We have a significant set of resources to devote to helping our portfolio companies. My other hat is I'm chair of Harvard Business School Angels of New York. Uh, it's a very active, uh, albeit new, angel network. Uh, we originally thought about investing only in Harvard grads, and then we looked at Jeff Skillings and some others, and we said, no, bad, <laughs> bad idea. So I, mean, I just want to know, where are my fellow board members? Do we have a problem with the whole Harvard and MIT? <laughs> uh, no MIT companies. Uh, so we, uh, we invest regardless of school affiliation. We prefer dropouts, actually. Because, uh, you know, they, the, the, the precedent of Zuckerberg at all looks good. Uh, and we have our next pitch night on the 29th of February. So we welcome applications from people seeking funding. Thanks. Hi, Eric. It's just for some. Right. Good evening, everybody. I'm Eric Nordlander. I'm an engineering partner at Google Ventures. Uh, Google Ventures is uh, Google Inc.'s uh, corporate VC. Uh, just like uh, Sim, we're financially motivated. So in a lot of ways, we do look uh, a lot like most other VCs. We uh, aim to invest about $200 million a year, everything from very early stage up to mezzanine rounds. And we've made investments in technology, life science, clean tech, um, things where you know it sort of makes sense with Google and things where it's completely outside of uh, with, what Google's interested in. So we, we try to be pretty diverse. In terms of myself, I've been at the fund for about 18 months. Um, I, Google Venture started in 2009. And prior to that, I was a software engineer at, at Google for about six years. And I, I still try to write code every day, and I was telling Albert earlier, Albert earlier, you still have to push the code to production to have it 
uh, actually count. So I'm going to push more code to production <laughs> after this conversation. I'm Albert Wenger. I'm a uh, partner at Union Square Ventures. Um, we're based here in New York, uh, focused entirely on investing in companies that do disruptive things on the internet. Um, our portfolio includes a lot of well-known consumer names such as Twitter and Tumblr and Etsy, um, but we also uh, do that on the business side. Um, the primary thing that we're really interested and excited about is finding things that form some kind of network because we think that's the one thing that's truly interesting and defensible in the internet. Thanks. All right. So now I'm going to turn it over to my city corridor folks to come up and do the first presentation. <coughs> How's everyone doing tonight? Let's get this open here. All right. Hello, my name is Caleb Yari, and I'm the Chief Technology Officer at City Corridor. Good evening. I'm Chad Priest, Chief Operations Officer with City Corridor. There we go. Okay. This is a common site in uh, most hotels or airports that you've probably been in before. These pictures are actually from LaGuardia right now. And uh, Caleb and I have a good friend in Charleston that runs a tourism company and we, we talked to him after we saw these things and we, we asked him about the different options he has for advertising. And what we walked away with was the fact that most of the options, like the picture on the left, offer no measurable ROI. Uh, there's no mechanism for real-time feedback uh, or input from or to the advertiser, and there's no mechanism to close the sale. So once someone has seen the advertisement, there's no way they can buy a ticket, make a dinner reservation, or take any type of action. We stepped back and took a look at the landscape of what solutions were available, and we saw that there were bits and pieces of this out there, but there was no one solution that really brought all these technologies together and solved the problem. Ultimately, the problem is the advantages of web and mobile are not being applied in digital signage advertising. So I'll have Vanna White go over to my model here. <laughs> so really, our solution is a seamless integration of web, mobile, and digital signage. Um, we, we started looking at the solutions that were out there and couldn't find anything that fit all the things we wanted to do, so we built one from the ground up. Uh, we built it around a digital signage framework, but we wanted to take that beyond what the, the standard deployments that we found were out there. So the first thing we wanted to do was make sure it was targeted. By the very nature of digital signage, we know who's going to see it based on the location it is, but we've also leveraged Intel's AIM uh, framework that allows us to look at the audience and determine their gender, their age range, and then we can filter content based on the actual audience, as well as measure how many people are seeing an individual ad and provide that feedback to advertisers. Beyond that, we also wanted to make it interactive. So if you go and look at a lot of digital signage displays, you'll actually see fingerprints on it, even though it's a static display because the audience anticipate, hey, this should be interactive. We're used to interacting with technology now. Going beyond that, as you see Chad will drive down in here, we want to be able to show, obviously, information about the, the advertiser, but we want to be able to close it through the point of sale. So the entire purpose of advertising is to, to drive someone through to a transaction and give them the opportunity to purchase something. So we've tied in a point of sale system. Once someone's bought it, we're working on developing a mobile application that will let us have additional stickiness with that customer. We know where they are, we know where they're gonna be, so we can continue to touch them as they're in the location. The final piece is analytics. So we wanna provide feedback to customers, uh, which is the advertiser, to let them know how effective their display is. What you see here is really the pretty face behind what we do. It's a framework that we built ourselves for deployment in Charleston for our tourism industry. But the magic of this is actually the back end, which is a cloud platform built on the Windows Azure platform. It allows advertisers a central place to log in and see in real time their sales across all the units or an individual unit. It allows them to look at advertising impressions in real time across all the units or individual units. They can change their inventory levels, so we ran into a lot of issues with people not being able to manage inventories across the web and local sales. They can adjust pricing on tickets in real time and add content in real time. So like I said, this is a deployment here that you see in Charleston for the tourism industry. We have several other industries we're looking at. So as you can see, there's a wide range of applications for the solution. Uh, Caleb mentioned we're currently in Charleston right now. We've got a, a deployment that's really going well for us. 
We've partnered with the Charleston Area Convention and Visitors Bureau. They're actually securing venues to host the machines and selling the advertising. Our responsibility is to deploy, build, maintain, and manage content. And um, the, the order started off with 50 units, and before the first unit was deployed, um, they ordered another 50, so it's gone really well. We're also looking for similar models in the uh, daily transit, and we're working on some solutions with a national retailer right now. So real quick, we're running out of time, but looking at the competitive landscape, everybody right now is very specifically tailored to either a digital signage application with print media or as a ticket selling kiosk. But what we've done is build a platform that allows all this functionality to be deployed on a single form factor. And moving forward, we're just looking to grow within the verticals we're operating now and add the verticals that we're not. And right now our estimate per vertical per market, the acquisition is approximately $1.7 million with a net return within that same year of $3.6 million. And that's based off of our model that we're operating under in Charleston right now. With, we're seeking funding of $7 million and with that funding, we'll uh, be, be growing in the markets that we're operating in now and then pursuing the, uh, the, the verticals we've discussed as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. It's great. Um, panel, do you, do you want to start? Yeah, it's him. That would be great. Kick things off. First of all, would love to visit Charleston. Looks really pretty. Um, I, I guess if I can ask two quick questions just for clarification. I um, would love to learn more about you guys as a team. Um, and also if you could just touch on kind of the ownership and CapEx related to the, the hardware deployment. <laughs> Sure, so uh, team-wise, we have uh, myself, obviously, and Chad, then we have our, our president, Warren Lash, in the audience here. We also have a uh, team internally of uh, two programmers, and then we do, uh, who are primarily the, the, our builders of it. We then uh, have some subcontract also for... Sorry, what, what did you guys do before? And I mean, okay, what's sorry, your background? Yeah. So my background, I, before this, uh, created a network monitoring application. Uh, that, so software development, it's a .NET application. Uh, we sell primarily to uh, large commercial and DOD applications. My background's in uh, retail marketing um, and uh, actually retail signage. If you follow up the rest of that question and talk a little bit about the cost, the cost structure. Absolutely, so, so right now, um, the cabinets themselves, so, so this is one form factor of, of many that we could deploy, but this is the one we're deploying right now. Uh, the cabinets themselves are actually built um, in Long Island here in New York, um, the shells, and the electronics are all assembled in our facility in Charleston. We've got uh, technical staff. We build the units in Charleston, and then we've got a staff that deploys, installs, and uh, does maintenance on the units as well. Our, um, our, our equipment cost right now is approximately $7,000 per unit. Obviously, those numbers change as you scale out, um, and, and our operating expense is roughly um, about $1,800 per month per machine if you look at it that way as well. So I, uh, I agree with you that there's certainly room, I agree with you there's certainly room for innovation here. Um, my concern is that you're in the less attractive part of the economic value chain, which is hardware, right? It's very, very difficult for a hardware company to get the kind of returns that venture capitalists are looking for. The obvious way to leverage what you've already built is number one, mobile apps, and I'm sure you've explored that, and I guess have not been satisfied with that path. But if I'm visiting Charleston, it seems reasonable for me to download a Charleston app, which would have all of this great content, and that gets you out of the hardware business. Uh, and I'm, I had another idea, but could you respond? Because I'm sure you've thought about sure, that. Sure, so this is a common question that comes up. One, we certainly want to integrate mobile applications into our deployments, um, and have looked at several strategies for that. But there's a passive audience that comes in, and you'd be surprised, uh, especially in Charleston or different tr tours and markets, that there's a very high percentage of people that either are not using technology now or haven't made plans before they get there. And those people are at the locations that we're at in hotels and airports, so they're driving by. Uh, mobile phone doesn't capture a passive audience. So it's a part of a strategy that we definitely see moving forward from a hardware software standpoint. So what we show is hardware, but really the, the platform is a software platform. It's a cloud-based application that we can deploy against multiple pieces of hardware. It's really a, a web UI that I can deploy against a mobile app. I can deploy against different pieces of hardware. Does that answer the 
So, uh, you're, of course, 100% right. My concern is that's not where the puck is going, mm -hmm. right? The puck is going to a world where everyone has a smartphone, not just the younger and more tech-savvy population, uh, where uh, that smartphone gets apps pushed to it based on people's travel plans, right? You look it up on TripIt or through other sources. And I'd much rather invest in a business that is congruent with the way the world will be three years from now as opposed to the way it is today. Well, and, and also just to um, further explain on some of the mobile apps that we're looking at. So for instance, right now I know in Charleston, the average tourist visits the city for 3.7 days. So through uh, you know QR codes and, and other applications we're looking at with our mobile app, would be to generate stickiness during that time, that, that visit. So once they've touched the machine, we're following up with them for that, you know, for, for that duration um, with offers that are more kind of hyper-local type advertising. The, the other thought I had is, as a way of getting you out of the less attractive hardware business, is I'm sure you've explored the possibility of partnering with the TVs, the, the people who run the TVs and the waiting areas there ports, all the people who have screen real estate. Is that an option? Yes. Yeah, so absolutely, and, and looking at an existing hardware platform to deploy against, again, because the solution itself is really software, is absolutely an option. <coughs> so my suggestion is to focus there, because it's much cheaper to prove yourself and get scale on that part of the value chain, and maybe down the road, explore hardware. The natural habit is, if you have a hammer, to look for nails, and if you have background digital signage, to think like that. But I'd rather think like a software entrepreneur and think, how can we use software to solve this problem, and then think, What's the cheapest way to get the software to my client? Thank you. Thank you. Eric? I'll, I'll put my advertising hat on for a second and say, you know, if you are going to be deploying all this hardware, it's really interesting to see how can you get more ads or better ads for your customers. So, you know, there's starting to be these nascent um, digital out of home advertising networks, maybe able to fill uh, some remnant inventory or maybe able to provide more, you know, just better ads for the customers. and potentially you can also make some money that way as opposed to you know, forcing, forcing all your clients to figure, figure out and they may not have the relationships to go and navigate and you know, set, up, set it up for every single location where they're gonna be active. I guess I have three questions. One is um, part of Sam's first question was um, right now in the Charleston deployment for instance, are you guys bearing the cost, the capital cost of putting all the hardware out or is sort of some of the local advertisers or, or, or partners, location partners paying for that? So, so we've got a, basically a, a rev share with the Convention and Visitors Bureau. So the, the machines are placed at no cost to the, to the hosting sites, and then there's, a, there's an ad share. But, but we, we've had a very positive response in terms of the, the ability that they've had to sell the advertising uh, has been very strong to where um, we, you know, we're looking at a, a cash flow positive situation very quickly. And you said it costs eighteen hundred dollars a month to operate one. Why is that so high? What What are you allocating to that? Okay, so that that's, that's actually that's actually writing off the machines as well across twenty four months. So that's taking into account the cost of the hardware as well. So that drives some of that number as well. And that that's that's uh, support. Pay, I mean, that's legal insurance. That's that's really we 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 run the numbers um, through and through, and that's. And, and when you go and pitch somebody, um, what kind of engagement metrics do you present? Sort of what kind of case study do you have where you say we've had this device sitting here for this many days and this many people interacted with it? What 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 do you tell people? Yeah. So at this point, that we we don't have that. So we're in very early stages of deployment, and that's part of the analytics back back end that we are increasing and continue to capture. So our our hope is to do twofold: one, an analysis and kind of consulting with the advertisers to encourage that, and then also from a sales standpoint. So we don't have enough in-house data um, available to, to make those at this point, but we will in the very near future. I, I, I think my main comment would be that in, if you want to do a $7 million raise, I think having numbers that show how these things actually perform in the field is probably going to be the critical proof point. Um, and if the ROI per installation is as positive as you say it is, and if you improve that, then I think that you have a more compelling case. Hi, good evening. My name is Deirdre Lord. This is Bob Wright, and we're the co-founders of the Megawatt Hour. We bring complete market transparency to obscure, broker-driven energy markets. So we are a platform that takes mind-numbing data and transforms it into actionable information for businesses that buy electricity, natural gas, and deregulated markets. 
uh, markets across the country have deregulated. So 60 to 70 percent of commercial and industrial customers are currently buying energy from someone other than their local utility. So someone other than Con Edison, for instance. But information doesn't flow freely between wholesale markets and business customers. As a result, they're spending an additional $500 million a year on consultants and brokers. Here's why they're doing that. They don't know how to navigate the buying process. It begins with a lot of data, either in spreadsheets or file cabinets. Customer goes out to find a supplier. There are more than 90 registered suppliers in New York State alone. Once they go out and get an offer, it comes back to them in a very confusing manner. More data, numbers, it's very hard to compare apples to apples. After they make a decision, and they do make a decision because the utility option is not appealing, it's more mind-numbing data, numbers that don't make a lot of sense. So our customers have said things to us like, you know, this industry is like the um, aluminum siding business of the 21st century. It's very, very, it's not an industry where they trust the suppliers. So here's how we're addressing this problem. We'd ask for one piece of information from a customer, their account number. We do all of the data gathering, we transform it into actionable, usable information. We simplify the process of understanding what product is right for that business. Once that product is identified, we provide them with access to what they should be paying for electricity and access to different supplier offers so they can compare apples to apples. We provide them with a term sheet that allows them to get access to suppliers easily. After the purchase, we provide information about how their pr product is performing, how their budget compares to their actual costs integrated with their financial services platforms. We give them clues about when to participate in the market, when to, when to access the market again. We're having good success. We're, we're providing service to beta and paying customers in New York State right now. Our customers are saying that this information is powerful and it's helping them in three ways. One, they're making better decisions. They have better analytics for their business. Two, it's reducing the administrative cost and hassle of ma managing this process. And three, we're reducing transaction costs. We're pro providing better value information <coughs> at a fraction of the cost that a consultant or broker charges. <coughs> Our target initially is commercial industrial customers, retail stores, universities, schools, commercial office buildings. And we will access that market differently based on the size and segment and cost basis for that customer. We also are considering um, putting together a residential application that's based on the federal government's Green Button Program, which provides all of us with our own energy information. It's a White House-based initiative. Right now, there are no other competitors that are ex doing exactly what we're doing. <coughs> Our closest competitors are consultants, and consultants tend to lack um, the analysis and the scale to provide this kind of information to their clients, so it's a potential channel as well for us. We are, so far, we're founder-funded. We are about to start a fundraising effort. We're gonna raise two to three million dollars to get to cash flow positive. The use of those proceeds will be to get to all deregulated markets. Those are the states that are green on the, on the map there. And the use of proceeds will also, will also hire key talent in marketing technology and sales. <coughs> Bob and I have been in this business, in the energy supply business, since it opened in 1998, and we are thrilled to really help bring about the promise of deregulation to the marketplace. We're looking forward to blowing this market up and wide open. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. All right, panelists. Albert, would you like to start? Uh, how um, labor intensive is it for you to pull the data together? Um, the promise of the green button program on the consumer end is like push button and you get the data, but how much time does it take you and to do that? We basically, it's 
not quite the push of a button, but we have the ability to gather data automatically from the utilities just by having their utility account number. So it's an automated scraping process that we've built and that we'll have to build for all utilities, but right now it's pretty <coughs> quick. Seconds, Bob? Fractions of seconds. Fractions of seconds. So once you've built it for a utility, so you, there's an upfront investment to build it for a utility and then you can sort of get Correct. it based on the customer number. Yes. Um, and then you're charging uh, an upcharge, let's say per? It's a subscription fee based on their total supply cost. It's about 1% of their supply cost. And that's a monthly or quarterly subscription. And how does that compare to how the current brokers charge? Consultants and brokers charge usually between 3 and 10%. <laughs> So how, how difficult is it for people to change providers? I'm trying to understand the frequency that people go, go through changing providers. Yes, um, it usually happens about once a year. Businesses will, will change their supplier about once a year. And, and are they able to model their future demand? Are they able to go through different scenarios? I'd imagine certain businesses just know they're gonna have different kind of cycles in terms of energy use. Yes, they, they are with our, with our platform. So they can uh, model different usage scenarios. They can identify, and one of the real values of the platform is they can identify good opportunities for buying based on forward market prices. Um, so they're also, you know, what if scenarios? What if I put a PV panel on, my, on the roof of my store, for example? How does that change my cost profile? I know a number, of, a number of consultants in this space charge based on money saved. Uh, is that an option for you? We, we are exploring it with customers. The challenge is that because the markets are so volatile, you've got to be very clear about what that benchmark is. Um, and so we're, we're exploring it. It's not a simple matter, but yeah. Uh, and I mentioned earlier our distinguished alum, Jeff Skillings. Uh, this is very powerful data. Is there any way to do what he would have done, which is use this to actually trade the, the energy in different forms? We've talked about it. Um, we really initially, in particular, want to make sure we don't have a bias towards any certain supplier or marketplace. Um, but once we are able to scale, um, there's some interesting opportunities to go and bring these customers directly to wholesale markets. Very enthusiastic about that, and just cut out the uh, the suppliers altogether. Yes. Any so, suppliers in the room? <laughs> <laughs> so that seems to me like potentially very promising, right? Because then you're you're effectively on the buy side, so to speak, as opposed to being in the research business. But I I didn't really see the logic of this. You didn't say Mint.com for energy, but that's how I understand it. Yes, sometimes I do say that, but yeah. Uh, but I, I could see how this could save you know, a small business like us and much larger businesses significant money if it works well, which I'm sure it does. <laughs> well, kudos for not saying mint.com for something. It's always points for that. And, and for being in a, in a sort of non-sexy, non-traditional non um, software industry. I, I guess, though, if we take the mint.com analogy and perhaps also think about the frequency of change, I'm a little bit curious as to why somebody would pay monthly for a subscription to information that they only act upon once a year. And if you guys hadn't thought about, you know, when I think about maybe it's more consumer model, co price comparison is usually charging suppliers some kind of lead generation fee. Um, and I know you have to tiptoe carefully around the potential for bias, but given that you're trying to add transparency in pricing to this market, um, there already is a clear benefit to people who are in the market to change subscribe to, to, to change uh, vendors, and if I think about analogous business models, whether it's a, a bank rate or a lending tree or shopping for a car, you have you guys thought about flipping the business model around in that respect? We have, um, and two one one um, response to the first point about the frequency. Customers who make this decision, while they they are only making it once a year are constantly, not constantly, but usually once a month or once a quarter wondering what happened. You know, did I make a good decision? I had a budget forecast that um, now is irrelevant. So we're building in things that will motivate people to come back. Um, 
and so um, and then we also are are really emphasizing that customers are always short they're always going to be a price price taker so the more they understand about the market dynamics and the ability to buy in June for a January contract the more opportunity there is for them to avoid you know big spikes in the market um, so but do they, they do they actually I mean maybe maybe going back to David's um, David's point do they do the customers actually want to do that or or would they be happy with you sort of stepping in and maybe assuming you can fix the 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 sort of what's the benchmark how much do I save actually step in stepping and in and do it for them because I, I got to imagine a lot of these companies don't want to even even if you have the data don't want to have the expertise or trade in right you know trade in energy themselves well we definitely need to either be pushing pushing that information to them or signaling it to them um, but to this the second question we have talked about having a marketplace where where we take some um, some fee from the suppliers we're interested right now and we're hearing from our initial customers that that the lack of bias is really important to them um, but especially for the smaller customers there is also an interest potentially down the road in having us just transact on their behalf and it would be very straightforward for us to to integrate that so. is the once a year switching a regulatory constraint or could people switch more frequently once they're on the platform they can switch more frequently they um, if there's no regulatory requirement and, and, and the example that you gave of buying in January forward um, so even once I've picked a supplier I have a lot of subsequent smaller decisions to make you can yes yeah I mean and especially a national player a national retailer for example will have contracts in ten different markets that come up ten different times of year based on who knows what you know when that market opened um, but there are other, um, you can also buy blocks of power, so you can buy a smaller component and then keep adding those blocks. So there are, there's more optionality around this decision that many customers don't take advantage of because they don't have access. And last question I have is how do um, these customers find you right now or how do you find them? What, what's the, and, and what's this sort of sales cycle look like? Um, the, right now we're, <laughs> I've been, I have a lot of relationships, so the larger customers I'm, you know, we're dealing with directly through um, through direct sales channels. We've been also um, working on email campaigns that have driven customers all the way through to the site in the matter of days. So the sales cycle varies depending on the customer size. It can be days to weeks and months. Thank you. That was great. Thank you. Hello. All right. So, um, why do you need uh, data analytics for cars? I'll give you a few examples over here. So, the first one is for used car market. So, if you're trying to buy a car today <coughs> and you want to know what you're buying, you know, you need um, diagnostic data and you need to analyze that data. So if a dealer is buying a car online, or you're buying a car in auctions online, today you really don't have any clue about what you're buying, other than the look and feel, Carfax report, that sort of stuff. <coughs> you really don't know what it is. Auto insurance, um, and most of the insurance companies in this country and overseas, they're launching this usage-based mm -hmm. insurance programs. They want your driver behavior data, voluntary program, and if you sign up for that program, if you're a good driver, you get 30 to 45, in a 40 percent off from your annual insurance premium. For that, you need driver behavior data from the car. Consumer market, you know, it's a fun stuff, you know. <laughs> so there are a lot of things that you can do, like you know, in terms of maintenance reminders. Um, uh, you know, there are a lot of interesting location-based services that we offer. Parental control for teenage drivers, you know, a lot of interesting fun stuff. Commercial fleet owners want to know, you know, what the health condition of their car, you know, where they are, that sort of stuff. So there are many different uh, verticals uh, where you need to analyze the data um, that comes from the car. And I mean serious data analysis, not charts and graphs. Um, you know, typically, we, um, uh, we rely upon small devices like that that plugs into a data port below your steering wheel above your gas pedal. Um, it um, you know, gets diagnostic data, it, gets, and it has a GPS chip, so we get the location. 
It has an accelerometer for detecting your acceleration. And then it also has a wireless modem just like your cell phone. You know, so it communicates with the cell tower. You know, we analyze all the data on board, send all this analytics to the server over the wireless network. Over there, we combine that with uh, the car's history, historical data, the user behavior data, and create data analytic products for different you know, verticals. So that's how we, we typically operate. Um, so fundamentally, we are not about that piece of hardware. And uh, we are fundamentally a data analytics company. If you look at our background, where we come from, what we sell, um, we have a SaaS model. Uh, we must, you know, all the analytics are available through a web portal. Um, and, and so fundamentally, we are about the, the analysis of the car uh, performance data, the driver behavior data. Uh, these are some of our products in different verticals you know, that I mentioned earlier. Um, and um, we are primarily a B2B company, although there are like opportunities for B2C, but today, um, you know, that's how we offer. Now, why is it a, a, an exciting investment? So let me talk about that a little bit. Um, so this is the market that we're dealing with. You know, the auto health for the used car sales market, for example. If you look at that, you know, dealers, used car dealers, you know, there are about 30,000 car dealers in this country. Every neighborhood has tons of those. Um, in 2011, there are 38.5 million used cars sold. You know, uh, 12.5 new cars sold. You know. Um, you know, let me tell, you know, give you a little bit, you know, some more data points about the other products in the market that we have. There are about 200 plus car, insu car insurance companies in this country alone. And many of them are actually launching this uses based insurance program today. Um, there are about 250 million consumer cars in this country and uh, about 25 million fleet vehicles. We moved there. Um, so, uh, so, we, uh, so this gives you a general idea about where we are in terms of our launch. Uh, we first started with the, the bottom most product over here, mine car. And that we released in the last year. Um, we totally do a B2B business over there. You know, large companies integrate with us and they take it to the market. And we are earning revenue and that's how we are sustaining today. Yes, all right. Um, and uh, you know, we have you know, SaaS models, uh, uh, you know, as I mentioned earlier, you know, decent profit margins. Uh, I have some projections about that that we can you know, talk about that. Competition, for example. Um, there are not a, you know, a whole lot of data mining companies for cars. And I listed a few. Um, some of them do some driver behavior analysis, and some of them are actually our clients. You know, so I mentioned some of those things, and you know, pretty much everybody in that M2M vertical know about us, what we do. Um, Sprint launched um, an audio box. I don't know uh, if you know of that company, Sprint. I'm sure you know. In CES, in a couple of weeks ago, Consumer Electronics Show, they launched our first consumer market product. If you just Google Agnik and audio, audio box, you can see all of it. I mean, all the analysts, uh, analysts talking about that. This week, two major press releases are going to come out. Um, I can talk about that, of course. Uh, we got first uh, in a three million investment from uh, DOD equity free funding. We pay everybody's salary, patented technology. We have about 18 employees as an associate. Never took any any money um, from any um, investors. So it's totally privately held. Uh, this is our team. Um, I'm actually a professor of computer science in the University of Maryland. Uh, um, just to you know give you a little bit of background, uh, I'm a fellow of IEEE and. So I have, you know, I've been running this company. Yeah, cut off. I'm pretty much done. So um, it's a mixture of um, and it's seasoned people in the business and, uh, and research. Any question? Thanks. <laughs> David, go ahead. You're grabbing the mic. Great lawyer. <laughs> That's the first feedback. Uh, so congratulations on raising three million dollars without giving up any equity Thanks. Um, Thank you. and building well <laughs> you're, you're welcome <laughs> so I'm, I'm glad I'll get some payback indirectly reduced uh, vehicle casualties on the road uh, and it sounds like you've done a great job building this up um, so the, the obvious question this actually echoes what we were talking about earlier is how much of this can be done with a smartphone which I carry around with me rather than the expense and hassle of a separate device so these devices are not really our headache anymore. Okay, large uh, companies like Sprint, you know, Verizon, I'm on camera right now, so um, I have to be careful. Okay, so major you know, vendors are basically now inventorizing. We initially started designing these things, you know, developed the technology, and then we completely outsourced. We are totally focused on our SaaS based and software model, so we don't deal with the hardware anymore. They inventorize, they do the fulfillment, everything. So, you know, we are totally a software company. Good answer. Sorry, just to build on that. What? So you have the smartphone app that you're focused you, on if at you this go point? To, or? If you go to the market and iPhone, uh, uh, so there are two apps that you find for Android and iPhone. We also have a BlackBerry app. Well, and 
just to sort of build on, you touched on a number of markets. Um, number one, obviously, small company. Um, you know, you have to kind of pick what you're focused on, and, and I, I believe, and do do sort of one thing well. Are one of those four your your focus? The consumer, the B two B, the used cars, the new cars, the insurance. Are you guys trying to tackle all of them at once, or is one of them where you're generating the most revenue, or where you plan to generate? So right now, most of our revenue is coming from the fleet market. And we are totally B2B. We hardly do anything there. We basically integrate with large companies like Telenav, and Sprint sells our product in fleet market because they make money from the wireless connectivity. So you know, Sprint, Verizon, they sell our stuff. So we, you know, it's totally B2B. In the consumer market also, we are B2B right now. Audiobox, for example, integrated with us you know, and they had a you know, press release in a couple of weeks ago. Um, Sprint is taking to the market. So, so it's primarily totally B2B, but there are some interesting things that are happening. And you're going to see some press releases coming out um, this this week, um, and so there are some interesting opportunities. We never took money, and um, so you know there are some opportunities for that B2C, uh, but totally right now we have B2. Does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, I think so. Um, and stuff like OnStar, Sync, um, in you know built-in telematics branded from the cars. Do you see those as a threat going forward, or no? You know we actually work with many of these OEMs. For example, I mentioned Telenav. Telenav man manages for Sync platform. And so these are in a primarily in car infotainment company. We are more about building statistical model data in a really serious data analysis, applying machine learning techniques. In a, for example, if you look at our mind car product, that blends in computation, computational advertisement with telematics data. Like if your car has an oxygen sensor problem, and you know about that, now you want to show them an advertisement and bring them to your repair bill. Now, how do you match them? So the kind of stuff that Amazon does, the kind of stuff that Google Ads does, the kind of stuff that Yahoo does. So we are bringing that sort of data mining technology to the telematics domain. So that's the kind of stuff that we do. In in-car infotainment, you know, those are typically our clients. We work with many of them. All right, so just to summarize, you guys don't care how the data is collected. You guys are gonna be the experts of how to turn that into something actionable. That is correct. You know, we play a role in how the data is connected on the software side. Uh, for example, those devices, you know, we actually do a lot of onboard analysis. Our core patents, you know, issued patents are based on that because that cuts down the wireless communication cost dramatically by more than a factor of 100. Because if you're trying to transmit the raw data with the wireless network, it's a lot of data. So in terms of that, you know, what we care about is like, you know, you know, you know we analyze the data on board, so we play a role in that. But as, as, as far as the hardware is concerned, you know, we don't really deal with that. So I think it's great that um, you know, you're moving towards having to see more of just a software play. I think, yeah, I'm, I'm just wondering, is there any reason you can't go straight to the car manufacturers and just have this be a piece of software that they just install you know, on, on cars that they're selling, and it's just, it's just an option that you can add, as opposed to it being a separate piece of hardware or something else? Good question. So you know, I write you know, about, what, 15 years ago, I was at Los Alamos National Lab, and, and I started interacting with Daimler Chrysler and, and some of the Detroit guys. And I interact with them. And today, I mean, we have some OEM relationships with them. The reason we didn't go through them is because they move slowly. Mm -hmm. We wanted to go through aftermarket quickly, you know, uh, go to the folks who are willing to pay us money up, right up front. So we initially went to the, the GPS tracking tech companies and told them that, you know, you all look alike, you know, why don't you integrate with us, take us to the market. So that's how we made money. And now, now that, you know, that is fairly secured, um, you know, we, we, we have a lot of OEM stuff going on, actually. My next question is, is there any way for a driver to take his you know, data or his history with them? It seems like you're kind of creating a resume for professional drivers, right? That's for the driver behavior analysis. Right. But we have vehicle health and fuel consumption. If your gas tank is empty, we know about that. But going back to your question, um, so there are, you know, there's a technology that we you know, brought in called Privacy Preserving Data Mining Technology. Department of Homeland Secu uh, Security, DHS, and it gave us you know, more than a million to develop that. So that allows you to sort of blend in cryptography with data analysis, okay? So, uh, so that gives you some digital rights to that thing. There are state regulations. I don't know if you're coming from that perspective. In California, for example, you cannot share your location data with insurance companies. So there are, you know, there's a privacy portfolio. We have a very transparent privacy policy there. Uh, so yeah, we, we, we take it very seriously. Uh, of course, it's not really relevant if Google is driving our cars. <laughs> we do use Google Maps. Uh, 
as you get more units reporting into you, whether they're your own units or other units that are using your software, your patents, um, it, it all goes into kind of a single large data store so that you become sort of smarter and smarter and smarter. Is that, am I understanding that right? Or is, is the data sort of segregated by who you're selling to and who you're selling through? Absolutely. So the data that's coming to, you know, we, we are the first point of contact. All the data, all the analytics come to us, so we own that. Okay. And uh, we, our, our you know, clients essentially, you know, uh, take that, those data products and this. And so we are first point of contact. We, and, uh, you know, you know, let's say two years down the line, another company you know, start doing similar things. We are going to face some things like that, but we'll have two years worth of data. Right. I, I think that is the magical part, and, and then also I think goes why this could be a very good B2B business is yeah. if you can really have this huge data advantage, and if you can do things with that data that somebody who gets a cold start can't do, then it becomes Absolutely. very interesting. Yeah. If I have a minute there, like, and just to interject a comment there. Um, so, you know, what we can do right now is we can do data-only deals. So, for example, in the repair service market, you're going to see some big names rolling out this thing free of cost, underwriting the entire cost. So, the device is totally out of the picture now. So, they are rolling out to their loyalty groups and, and, and to, you know, to their customers. Now, we are also getting driver behavior, and those guys are not interested in driver behavior. They're interested in fixing your car. So, now I can go to an insurance company and say that, forget about the device, you don't need that cost. Just do a data only deal with us. Yeah, that's great. Very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Introducing myself, I'll just start with a short movie and then we'll go on from there. <laughs> Coupons for five free hugs. You don't like it? Are you kidding me? I love it. It's so creative. Coupons for hugs, which are usually free. This makes it official, which is so great. I was so proud of myself when I thought of it because you're impossible to buy for. You never want anything. Um, things I want. Robot dog, night vision goggles, bug vacuum, GPS watch, speakers that look like rocks. I love my wife, but she sucks at giving gifts. I'm sorry for the pay channel language. Okay, hi. So my name is Chen. I'm from Wishmesh. Uh, this is a problem we all have. We don't really know how to bring the right gifts even to the closest. Oh, sorry. Even to the closest people. Something? Yeah, sorry. Uh, it's pretty hard. There are solutions out there. You have registries which are pretty formal, mainly for weddings and baby showers. Uh, we have wish lists which are supposed to help us. It's like personally, I have an Amazon wish list. You can find one on Target, eBay, any major site. There is a wish list there. But I never got anything but to me, never from any of my wish lists. And there are suggested sites. And you know, if I don't know what to bring, my grandfather was 80 years old. I'll go to a suggestion site, get something. It will give me a nice idea, but. It's really not personal. On the other hand, we have Facebook. Facebook is where all of our friends and family are there. Uh, we can see their pictures, we can see the stuff they're talking about to see what they like. But what's missing is really uh, what they would like to get for their birthday or any occasion coming up. And that's exactly where Wish Mesh comes in. Uh, sorry. Imagine instead of today when you use Facebook, one of your friend's birthday is coming up, you'll just, you know, you can tell them happy birthday, and usually that's where it ends. Instead, you'll be notified three weeks in advance, you have a link, you'll be able to click and see exactly the things he would like to get. So let me show you for a couple of seconds how Wishmesh looks. For example, when I go into Wishmesh on the left side, I can see the upcoming events or occasions of my friends, so I'll just go to one of my friends, I click on him, and I can see the stuff he really would like to get. For example, here I'm just gonna go for this game and I can, you know, I can socialize, I can talk about it, I can offer him stuff, but I can just go and buy it to him and it will take me automatically to the retail site. On the other hand, there's me. I want to get the stuff that I really want, but as I told you, I already have a wish list on Amazon. Wishmesh knows how to aggregate from all different sites the wishes and put them into one space into uh, your Facebook account. Another thing is I don't really want to manage a wish list. From my point of view, I don't even want to be in the application on a daily basis. And the main idea in, in Wishmesh is I surf the net every day. I see stuff in e-commerce sites that are interesting to me, and I can just add them by sharing them. Pushing the, the Facebook share button, I share the items, and the items will be automatically added to my wish list. So I don't have to think about it. I do my business 
day to day and I see the stuff that's interesting for me. Another thing is I don't always even know what I would like to get for my birthday. And here, Wishmesh acts uh, a little bit like a suggestion site, but it's uh, tailor-made for you. The main idea is, oh, sorry, I need to get the feed. The main idea is that uh, my friends probably know me the best. If I go and I play soccer with one of my friends and he just got himself a new pair of sneakers, that's probably interesting to me because I play with him. The same with any other kind of sport. Wishmesh builds your own social profile from the things you add and from the things your friends add and, and offer to you because they know you. So instead of getting something which is not personal, you get uh, offers which are very, very personal. Okay, so let's see, let's get back here and see where we are now. Wishmash is currently tar targeting the, the vertical um, of uh, young kids. We see the market as, as very profitable. Uh, video games are, are, yeah, so thank you. Uh, and video game market are, are very high on the, on the gift list. Uh, every you can see them on the top five. You can see the Wii, you can see the uh, Kinect. <coughs> But let's rush a bit because I'm running out of time. So how do we generate revenues even today? Step A is affiliate programs. Everybody, everyone that buys something from us, automatically get, we get some uh, account. We also are working with several companies from a B2B to C. Their gain is that uh, um, we expose their items not only to the people that have been to the website, we gain uh, more traction. And of course, the next step, mobile application, which currently we still do not have, and expand to more social networks. So what we're looking for, uh, we're looking for uh, uh, to, to get uh, $1 million in order to have 215K active users, and also to make partnerships to get us to, to uh, big retailers here, which can definitely ramp us up. Thank you very much. How many users do you have today? Uh, uh, that's, I was going to say, that's probably going to be the first one. We almost have nothing. We just, uh, uh, we started the business in, in April. We won a competition in May for an innovation. The beta came up end of December. So we're about a month up. We have 1,500 users. We're not even marketing it yet. We're now all in the A-B testing phase. So we know for sure, as I said, we were targeting this vertical. We know it works but we definitely need to scale it up and, and see how it works. Uh, but we still didn't spend any uh, large amounts of money on marketing, therefore we're definitely not in the high numbers yet. And, and um, how does this spread virally instead of Facebook? So when I install the app, what, how do I invite friends or how does, oh, how does okay. it spread? So, so uh, as I said, automatically uh, it notifies you it's like whenever one of your friends' events is coming up. Uh, it also depends who's your audience. When we're targeting kids, it's more about them. So kids, we, we generally, it's like we push them, it's like you want to get this gift, let your friends know, publish it as much as possible. Every item you see, you can, as I said, as you can see, you can comment on every item you can see that on their Facebook walls. When we're targeting uh, adults, usually it, it might even seem a bit greedy to ask, it's like, this is something I want. It's more about, you know, you and trying to talk to your friends, like, tell me what you would like to get, because it's a lot easier, because it saves you the, the time and hassle, and if you need to buy something to somebody you don't have a clue about. So we're trying to get you as active as possible. We have quizzes, uh, with, like, which we learn about you, and also, uh, of course, you can uh, publicize, sorry, publish uh, the details, so you can uh, compare yourself to your friends. It's especially, um, um, you know, because the vertical we're using is, is the kids, it's like they're very competitive, so it's really nice, like, you know, yeah, I got this score, you got that score, and we make sure every time, like, the, the ads are right in there for watch match. And how do you pick kids as early adopters, given that they're sort of the, you know, they can't get through the buy now most of the time until they run I, I took, at, at this stage, uh, I'm not really looking for conversion. They're the ones that make the buzz. They're, you know, I, I kind of rushed through the last part because, uh, uh, they're the ones that have no problem to add applications, to share, to talk about it, and at the end of the day, especially when you look into video gaming, they're the ones that are going to bug their parents and grandparents about, you know, get me this and that, because like you said, they don't have the money. I don't expect them at the first stage to, to be the buyers, I expect them to create the buzz to bring me virally more users, and to be the ones that bring their parents, because at the end of the day, at those ages, the parents are the ones that buy them. Of course, later on, once we see this picks up, we're going to target audiences that makes uh, more sense uh, from a conversion <laughs> point of view. We're looking to power moms, the people that also have the money uh, to buy the items. 
yeah, me as a baby. It's, it sounds to me that you're going to want to have an experience for people that aren't your friends or on the platform. Is there anything there that helps you, helps guide you towards the gift? You know, if they're not, you know, either your friend or they're, or they're using your app. Can you, can you please repeat it? I no, I, I'm, I'm just wondering what the experience is for finding a gift for someone who's not using the app already. Uh, probably the beginning, what the only things we have uh, looking for somebody that uh, will be demographics and stuff we know about you. So if you're looking for some, of the, like for a gift to somebody that doesn't have the app and I don't have any way to collect information, of course I can, if I have the, the right, uh, uh, the, the right, uh, Missing word here. Never mind. It's like uh, the ability I can get his likes and shares, and give you some information. Uh, this is something, by the way, uh, Shopify does today, but it's it's still on person. The, the main idea we need the users. We need you to use the application, of course, so we can gather more and more information. And the main idea is the more friends you have, the more we know about you. So sure. we have your social environment. No, I guess I guess what I was getting at is, you know, if I'm trying to buy a present for you know my friend's child, you know, you, you can't sort of pull in. You know, maybe I'm not. Facebook friends with them, but maybe there's things that they've done, right? There's, they've shared things, or there's things about their age group or peers that they can help you, you know, choose the right game you, or whatnot. Okay, now I got it. Yeah, that's like one of the things we are going to do in the future is, like you said, if I don't have a clue what to buy a five year old kid, we probably can give you from the database we already have what are the most popular gifts for that age group. Yeah. So uh, it's certainly a nice looking app. I do have a couple concerns. One is this is a really crowded area. I've probably seen four companies in the last past two months in wish lists and gift splitting and so on. Um, so that always means that there are 10x as many entrepreneurs out there trying to solve this problem. So the odds that you're going to be the guy who builds a real company versus all the others inherently are lower when a lot of other competent people are pursuing it. Um, it, within our firm, we always have a bias towards people are pursuing things that are less popular, um, that are not hot and sexy for exactly its reasons, because those are the better returns. Um, a related concern is no barrier to entry, right? That this is not sophisticated technology. Correct me if I'm wrong, but just no, no, the basic. Totally app. right. From an IP point of view, I think the two things we do differently, and probably any person who does something similar will tell you the same is. Uh, first thing, even the, the fact that we know by using your share, which nobody does it, to know if it's a product or a non-product, I don't think it's, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to, to implement it, but nobody else does it today, and it's, it's, it's a nice feature because you don't have to implement any add-on, nothing to your browser. Uh, the second thing, uh, the way we do like the, the social profiling, so of course at, at stage zero we don't have any advantage, but uh, I think the way we do it is we get you like better results because there is nobody out there today that does it. In the future, but that's right, but course. you have to think a few years ahead, right? So maybe no one else in the world does this today. Let's say you're successful, right? You yeah. get some money from from a great VC, and you get written up. Ten other competitors emerge within two weeks because this is relatively easy to do, and they copy you in all sorts of different niches and different languages and so on. And then it's much harder. That's what happened to Groupon, right? No technology barrier entry. Yeah, but uh, I think that most of these, like most of these uh, uh, companies, at the end of the day, what's what's uh, the biggest difference is how many users you have. So if you're first in the market and you could capitalize and have enough users, I think it's like, I, I wouldn't mind, you know, uh, like uh, having uh, their business right now, it's like they're doing pretty well. So the thing is, uh, I, I totally agree, there is no uh, huge IP, like intellectual property here, uh, but for sure I think the most important thing you hear are the users, and usually that's what we hear from guys like you, it's like, show me, you have 200,000 users and you're good to go. At least for us, that's not how we would think. We want to know how many users we have three years out. Yeah, no, for and sure. It's like I, I, I think worry about once that. again. I think that if I, if I look into it in the future, besides the, it's like it's something that once I have this information, I think it's very valuable information because I, I can use it as a, as an ad platform for for other companies, and I'll be able you know to give coupon companies be able to to help them target their audience so much better and just just you know send them and like you know. Uh, there are so many options. Like, if I have a big enough database, I can do group buys. I can do like you know, I can do if you know, say buy. They do something. Like that. So there's so many options out there once you have the database. Um, on on the point of um, being first to market and kind of having that advantage, I, I mean, I'm I'm actually fine with saying because the first thing that struck me, and I'm sure you guys found this as you were doing your research, as you were looking to purchase a URL domain. There have been wish cup list companies as long as the internet has existed. For sure. And um, you know, sometimes ideas are too early or things change. Uh, you know, Facebook maybe adds a dynamic that that changes the market fundamentally. People haven't yet capitalized on. 
I was curious why you think, I mean, I, I'm sort of struggling because I, I feel like there's, you know, every permutation of Wish and List somewhere on the internet has existed as a business in the last 10 years. What's new? What do you guys think is going to change? And my perception of the problem, and I'm not an expert in the wish listing space, is that fundamentally, um, I think to Alvin, what you were saying before, what do people do when they're not shopping for someone? Because the, the problem with gifts is that it's not a frequent thing. I mean, I'd like to say I buy gifts for my friends on a weekly basis, but I don't. You know, I, I've got Valentine's Day coming up, which I'm scared to death of, um, and I've got you know a couple. You know, I've got my wife's birthday, my kids' birthday, and my parents, but. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not shop, You know, outside of seasonal stuff, I'm not shopping constantly for other people. And so, you know, I may discover you and find this is a great way to create a wish list for me or to uh, explore somebody else's wish list. But most of the time, I'm shopping for my own personal needs. And so, how do you keep that? Assuming you capture 250,000, 500,000 users, um, how do you keep them engaged? Uh, okay, exactly. I think it's it's one of these things that the more users you have, that the more like the application becomes more interesting. Because I think, uh, as I said before, like I we see this. Why? Thing, sorry, why? Why? Because I think it's something that if you look at it from a different angle, first thing I think it's very interesting to know just from a I'm not sure if it's the right word, it's like voyeurism point of view. You would like to know. I want to see other people's pictures. I want to see the stuff they that interests them. Oh, right. sorry. I also want to see the stuff that interests them. Because it's it's something people do. It's what we do. We would like uh, I don't know, to pry into other. That's <laughs> my point of view. That's face. I, I guess so. I guess I no. I agree with you. But I guess just like there have been a dozen wish list apps, there have been a dozen share my purchases, share the things that I like apps, and you know it's it's. I guess I'm still struggling to understand why like, you guys are, are solving that. I I think that where the, the, where the others have, have mostly stumbled. Uh, first thing, we talked to several companies also back home in Israel that tried to do it and, and failed. I think. Like you said, I think the time factor is is pretty pretty right now. Like even with the fact that you would see that uh, in, in the last Facebook conference, they they added the, the like use your own verbs like want, which it's it's just missing for there. It's like it's really the right time, and, and the e-commerce like ramping up now in f-commerce. We think it's like a great time. We think, we think it's something that people would like. Like you said, it's like your wife's wedding, uh, sorry, uh, Valentine's Day is coming, and you're, you're scared. It's like, and it's a problem we all have. We don't have a good, there are no good tools out there. So, you know, you try something and hope it works. Uh, we think we can, like, and especially with Facebook, it's, you know, everybody is there. And if it's going to be uh, accessible and easy and you won't even have to think, you'll just know what to get, uh, we definitely think, you know, that's, that's the right approach. All right, thank you. I'm gonna... So my name is Daniel Cowan, I'm the CEO of Echo Labs Limited, that's the creator of Echo. And what we're trying to do is create a new platform that lets you see the most relevant thoughts, events or discoveries happening in the area around you or in the places you're in. We notice something strange, uh, ironically we're all very connected now, we're on Twitter, we're on Facebook, and we can see what our friends and people we follow are doing the whole time. But we can't see what people in the same room or the same area are thinking or discovering. And what we also can't do is see what's relevant, what the crowd around us has agreed or confirmed is relevant. So what we've tried to do is create a platform, which I'm going to show you in a second, uh, that keys into all these factors. and shows you in a very local space, uh, you can actually pick your location on the map, what is happening on re in real time, what people are thinking and what they're coming across. And it also tries to tap into crowdsourcing and the notion of amplification to show you what's relevant. Now, the, the last point up there is visualization, um, which is going to be ironic if this doesn't work. But what I'm going to try and do now is show you a live demo of the app, which is now in beta mode. There we go. It's working. And what you see on the screen in front of you is what happens when you first open the app. Unfortunately, the text is going to be a bit unreadable to most of you. And this is the My Area screen. And this is where we are right now in New York. I'm the only person using this, so there's not a lot of content in there right now. And moving around on the screen in front of you are the loudest echoes that are taking place right now in this area. And loudness is a symptom of three things. Uh, number one, have people amplified it? Number two, how recent is it? Which particularly comes into play when we're at live events or conferences like this. Uh, and the third is your reputation in our system. So if historically your content has been amplified by the community, the next time, instead of just ego casting, we know your content's good, so we're going to amplify it louder and have it go into the system slightly bigger. Now, if there's a place that you know you want to go to, or there's a, a bubble on the map that interests you, you can click on it, which I'm going to try and do now, if you bear with me. 
and you can go inside that place. So let's go inside Rockefeller Plaza, which is where we are right now. And what you can see in here, in rank order, are the loudest echoes in this place, in this building right now. And you can scroll through those. So your casual user up top will just see at a glance what is most relevant and what people are saying right now. Your power user will go to the bottom and see the, the less relevant thoughts that people haven't really tuned into. Now, the color coding is interesting. I'll take you through that very briefly. Uh, when you add an echo to the system, you can choose to add a thought, an event, or a discovery. Now, the event and discovery platforms are going to end up being the monetizable platforms down the line. But again, when we go back to the screen and you see the colors, you're only going to see the events and the discoveries that the crowd agrees is worth seeing around you. So the whole time we're keying into this notion of relevance. I just want to show you how it all moves. So I put this in the system earlier uh, on a different device, and then Sydney, one of my team members up in Montreal, amplified it. If I go in there and amplify it, you can then see everything moving around as it retakes its place in the order of things. So this has been amplified and it's been amplified recently, so it moves up to the top. Down the line, as we develop this, you're going to be able to click on users' names in here and see what else they've echoed. So someone says the lattes here are awesome, and you think they've got great taste in coffee, you'll be able to see what else they've been echoing around the area. Um, we also have a feed in here, which we're going to be developing further, which is uh, your echo feed, showing you what people have amplified, and the ability to search for places. And you can also add places into the system yourself, um, whether it's a room or whether it's uh, a forum to discuss a certain topic. What I'm going to do now is take myself off the screen and just take you back to the slides, uh, which looks like we're going to have to key through again, and just talk through a few extra points in the last minute or so that I have left. So here you can see a world of echoes. And you know, one of the problems we face is that it's a very flexible platform. It could be used almost anywhere. Um, when it comes to rolling out, which we're doing soon, we're going to be focusing on four primary use cases. The first is events, particularly multi-stage events. So I'm at a big music festival, and I know Food Fighters are normally good, but I'm dubious about going over to see them play because I heard they're not that great anymore. So I can go into the echo chamber that relates to that stage and see what's going on, see what the vibe is, see what people are saying. Second use case is going to be campus, and we've actually got a couple of tie-ups with uh, campuses in Canada and the US where student newspapers are going to be using this as their voice on campus leaving echoes around campus for students to go and uh, rally around and amplify, and vice versa, students taking the initiative and deciding to put things around campus and get other students to rally around them. There's some really fun local community initiatives we want to get behind as well. So for example, at Seattle's uh, Next 50 uh, celebrations this year, they're celebrating the 50th anniversary since the World Fair being there. One of the ideas that was uh, positioned with us was um, setting up an echo chamber in each of the 127 boroughs around Seattle for people to converse around and discuss current issues, future topics, improvements, uh, whether it's environmental or local community. And finally, local discovery. Uh, and that's a very competitive space, but we think if people have a meaningful experience with this uh, at any of the above, then they'll carry this with them and they'll echo and amplify thoughts around them. I don't know if we have time, but uh, these questions will probably come up. But these are just some of the main challenges we have. Uh, user acquisition, which uh, really keys into our, our, our use cases and how we're going to approach marketing. Content acquisition, which we have addressed. Um, and some more images for you to have a look at. And our timetable, which I'll tell you about in a moment. And then some links that you guys can go to if you want to see more. Great, thank you. That was a technological first for Chad Bourne, I think. That was amazing. <laughs> Who wants to start? Are, are, are you starting this sort of completely cold, meaning um, are you, you know, is the only data that appears on the system data that's generated by users on the system? Uh, no, it won't be. So over the last few months, we've really been getting to know the different APIs out there and work out where we can take really meaningful content from that is as close to Echoes as possible. So on day one, when user one goes out on into the, the landscape in Montreal or, or in the US, they're going to get a combination of four square tips, uh, derivatives of things like Yelp and Zagat, um, data we pulled from Songkick and from their API. And then we also approached a lot of bloggers, particularly in the food space, and got them on board to let us use their content and link to it through Echoes, because Echoes can have URL links in them. And then we'll, we'll track the analytics for that as well down the line and go back to those bloggers and say, hey, this is how much traffic we generated for you through Echo. Do you want to start using it directly? 
that's just the timetable up there, which I think is quite helpful, because what I wanted to say on that point was that as we go out country by country, city by city, we'll be making sure there's content in those places before we head out there. Um, first of all, kudos. I like the design and think it's very unique, uh, which I think is very important for, for mobile apps. I mean that sincerely. Um, what, if you think about the different sort of social and mobile discovery apps that are attempting to solve the what should I do now or what should I, where should I go and what's happening around me, do you skew? Do you, do you want to skew more to the you know friend side? Think Foursquare. Do you want to skew more towards the sort of interest uh, or, or review space like Yelp? Where do you see this going? I see it being most disruptive in the review space. Uh, I think the review space is a bit stagnant right now. There's really three big players. And reviews are often too long, often out of date, and very repetitive. And that's where we want to get in there. We want to take all this information that's out there and capitalize on it and take it and put it in places in real time and make it relevant through crowdsourcing. That, for us, is the key, the key target. I think if we try and become a new social network or a new Twitter, we're, we're dead in the water. But if we can make local discovery more relevant and make reviews more relevant through this platform, we might get somewhere. So is it fair to summarize this as a real-time push search engine for what's going on around me based on a wide array of inputs? Is that effectively what you're doing? And until we've got enough users in the system adding unique content, then yes. That's particularly for the local discovery element. But when you're at a live concert, when you're on a campus, in that sense it's not. It's, it's a very organic experience there because people are going to be putting in their thoughts and, and their feelings about an event in real time. So if I'm walking around and I'm looking for a restaurant to eat in or something to do, today I can use Siri, I can use Google, there are lots of search engine type tools to help me, mm -hmm. and if I want specifically reviews, I can go to Zagat's or other things. So what's the use case where someone wants, <clears throat> doesn't know what to do, it's just sort of it's a wide open canvas, sounds like, and I want stuff pushed to me. Can you explain to me the problem that you're solving, that this is a good solution for? The problem that we're solving is, if you, if you know roughly which location you want to be in, or exactly what restaurant you want to go to, you're going to get very, very recent data on what people are thinking about that. Even more recent than it would be on Foursquare, for example. And you may even get a conversation of sorts. So someone can posit a thought in there saying the macaroni cheese was excellent. Someone else can say, well, I came back the day after and it really wasn't. And other users who see that will be amplifying those in real time and you'll see them buying for attention in real time. It's, it's that interactive element that we're trying to add to it. Any other questions for the panel? I, I just have a hard time, uh, you know, bridging the gap between pulling in content from all other places that aren't real time, and then figuring out how how we're swinging across that gap, and you're going to see, you know, what someone thinks of the mac and cheese that they're eating right at the moment, right this moment. There, there is triggers. I mean, that initial seeding process is really there to give the early adopters something to engage with. Now, if they amplify those echoes, then it's become real time because they're amplifying it based on their experience just now. Um, you know, by going out at events, by going out at campuses and trying to hit those markets, we're trying to, trying to posit ourselves in high density areas where there's a lot of people who could be commenting in real time on things. So, you know, our aim is to wean ourselves off of that data in due course. I just want to echo something Sim said earlier, which is a common reason for startup failure is trying to do too much. So it sounds like you're trying to solve several very difficult problems. Right, one is aggregating data from disparate, inconsistent data sources. Then another is creating a community on top of it. Mm -hmm. So my suggestion is to, to focus on one problem and really crack it right. before you do another. The first problem is really, really tough. And if you can just do that, that's very useful and Google or Siri would buy you uh, or, or, or you can you know, go build an independent company. Um, but trying to build a community on top of it, that's a whole other challenge, which is actually even harder because communities require getting, uh, uh, require that you have the functionality, plus you have to have all the, the, the functionality to support the people engaging with one another directly. Mm. No, I, I take that on board. The, the challenge we face is that whichever user group we go to, one expects one and the other expects the other. You know, a group, a group of users who go into this and they're super social and very into Twitter and Facebook are like, well, where's the social aspect? And then your users that are kind of just looking for that aggregated content don't really care about the social aspect. But to keep those social aspect oriented people happy, you have to have some data in there. But you can only optimize for one variable at a time, right? So I'd argue Google is, with due respect, 
hurting its search results by trying to be social, right, and incorporating irrelevant Google Plus stuff. So by making it social, you're making my search experience weaker, and then I'm less likely to actually use your app. Right? You don't want to be like bump, everyone downloads it, but they don't use it. Right. It, it's worked out this way, but the social aspects of this are going to be developed later. So the first aspects we're going to be hitting are getting user-generated content and getting relevant content out there into the system, which isn't by design, but it's worked out that way. This is sort of not necessarily a specific observation to you, but it's, it's something I'm thinking about both what you're talking about and what the previous company was presenting. I think um, there's often this challenge of um, slicing things potentially too thin on the internet. So um, you're combining real time and a particular geography, and so you're facing a particularly hard cold start problem, right? Because having density of people in real time in a particular location um, it's very, very hard. And so at some point, that'll be true. And it'll either be true because it'll be a concert, for instance, where somebody somehow promotes that everybody download the app and get into some enhanced experience. Um, so I think trying to figure out whether you're not slicing things too thinly is a very important problem on the internet. And um, somebody recommended going to people who always have a, ha have a wish. Again, you know, I think the most successful systems on the internet um, didn't try to predetermine a very thin audience. They kind of built something that could potentially work for a lot of people, and as a result, they didn't have to kind of try to find a small space. And making something viral inside of a small space is maybe the best way of putting it. It's very, very hard. Mm -hmm. Things go viral if they can go viral at, across as many dimensions as possible. And so by constraining yourself to both real time and a location, you really put a very hard cap on the virality of, of the thing itself. Thank you, that's good feedback.